What's going on everybody? Culture Dog Sam Hatch back with another Blu-ray review. I got a Blu-ray copy of the 30th anniversary of the Transformers, the movie. The mid 80s was a time where the Transformers definitely ruled. Um, I have to come out and I've, I've already come out on, on my website and, and talked about this before. But not that I'm not a fan of the Transformers, but I'm not completely agog, like in love with the Transformers. Uh, obviously, I thought the to toys were super cool when they started rolling out. Hasbro started releasing them over here in the States. And yeah, it was super cool having like a Lamborghini Countach or something that could transform into a robot. Uh, I think eventually where the divide happened was when it was marketed as uh, a story. And I thought they were awesome toys and who didn't want an Optimus Prime? Super cool stuff. Um, but it was like a combo of things. I did, of course, pick up when Marvel Comics first dropped the comics because Marvel is was integral to creating narratives out of toys. And I had certainly picked up you know, ROM, which was a, a comic series based on a big, goofy cyborg toy, and then also Micronauts and Shogun Warriors, etc. So Marvel had a long history of making comics out of nothing or making comics out of toys and creating a story where there had been none before. So Transformers you know, had some gorgeous cover art, and I liked the toys, so why not pick it up? So I checked those out. It was pretty cool. And then the TV series rolled around, and, and I watched it, but I never fell in love with it. I never fell in love with the characters. The character designs themselves were serviceable, but they weren't really inspiring. I was even joking around with a, with a friend who's a legitimate fan of, the, of these um, series, and was joking around on the fact that there was always like, 30 different variants on any type of Transformer, and they all just had this blank kind of face. It's hilarious because you listen to the commentary tracks, and they're all, you know, espousing the wonders of this series and about how amazing the character faces are because they're angelic, you know, this, this kind of blank angelic look where I was like, yeah, they just kind of look bland to me and uh, lacking character. But what are you going to do? But anyways, as a fan of what was going on in Japan and Transforming toys, etc., uh, I was definitely keen on collecting models and when transforming toys came it was cool because i didn't have to build the model in order to transform it but i was picking up a lot of import kits etc and then keeping an eye on what was available over there so it quickly became apparent uh what was going on with the transformers franchise which was hasbro finding a bunch of different things from japan and repackaging them for the american market as this unified front this transformers toy line um, so as far as it got you know, transformed, so to speak, from that into this entity, into this franchise, it always felt slightly bogus at the core for me because I always knew that this stuff wasn't the seed of somebody's vision or anything like that. It was corporations pushing money around on tables and, and just, you know, making things happen. And, you know, there's some special f features on this release that were ported over from an earlier special edition where they're like, yeah, how did you come up by the name of the Transformers? And there's just icky talk about the client and this and that. And, yeah, this is corporate, corporate product. And uh, so, yeah, it always it never connected with me in the way something like Robotech did. Uh, you know, I was collecting toys and models, as I mentioned before. So one of the things I was collecting was the Robotech models, which were rebrands of the the Japanese, you know, macro, Macros models, some Orgus models, etc. I was putting those together. And so then when the Transformers dropped and I was seeing a Valkyrie repackaged as, you know, Starscream or Jetfire, I think it was Jetfire, I was like, what? Like, so the real kind of disparate Frankenstein nature of the Transformers was so apparent. It stuck out like such a sore thumb at that point. I'm like, all right, so Jetfire on the TV show can't look like this because this is clearly Macross product. So it's like Transformers is, it's not a thing. It's a, it's a stew of just random crap grabbed from here and there. Not to say that I didn't like that random crap when I first time I saw Dinobots. I'm like, no, oh, that's super cool. There's these Japanese toys that are Dinobots. And, but yeah, they didn't live and breathe in my soul as characters for, like they did for plenty of other people. So that much is not hatred. It's, not, it's just more like disappointment. <laughs> 
Whereas I totally acknowledge and recognize what it means to other people and, and, and how much it means to other people. So when the Transformers, the movie dropped, I had clearly been watching the television series abstractly, not loving it as much as I did Robotech. Um, but this came in theaters and, you know, my parents weren't really interested in going and I didn't go with any of my friends. But that said, I had to live with this for quite some time because both family members and friends were just nonstop talking. It was, you know, Rodimus Prime this, Unicron this, B-Wop non, Ninny Ground, Bob, Bob, Boop, Bob, that. And, you know, I was essentially almost not wanting to see it because hearing about it so much and the hype about it. So uh, I never, ever, ever checked out Transformers the movie. I just lived my life and I, I'd lived with the nerd shame of not having embraced it, not having seen it in theaters, and just kind of moved on. Later on, I actually was quite a fan of the Beast Wars series. I thought that was a lot of fun and some cool early you know, TV CGI. Uh, so I, I dug that quite a bit. I've seen all the Transformers films, uh, mostly in the theaters. I think the fourth one I just saw on, on video for the first time. And again, it, that's a hot mess. But it was uh, with some intrigue that I was able to finally sit down and watch this for the first time. It had been released in like a 20th anniversary DVD and I believe a 25th anniversary DVD. Uh, but now they went back and did a new 4K scan and got things looking even better than ever. And this thing is pretty stellar. Yeah, the Transformers is you know, the tale of Unicron, this this planet-devouring, like, Galactus-esque type being that's going around and sucking up other Cybertron-esque like planets and their denizens and crushing them up and turning them into fuel, basically. It's also the tale of what's going on with Optimus Prime and the Autobots, and they've ceded control of their home planet to the Decepticons, led by uh, Megatron, who, you know, is the big bulking, terrifying leader who turns into a tiny gun. Yeah, whatever. Take it with a grain of salt. And some of his other underlings, like Starscream, who's always looking to jockey for power, etc. So it was an opportunity to, to take a little bit of a darker turn and off characters. Uh, though there's a, a gag in this where you know Megatron, apparently in the show, would always miss his first shot when he was a gun, whereas this case, he actually takes a dude out right away. Unicron is chewing up entire, you know, civilizations of robots and, and killing them. Um, some main characters are killed. So it tells their tales and then a little bit of a uh, Spike Witwicky, but mostly the younger Daniel Witwicky and him hanging out with Hot Rod and some other side adventures that go on. There's a little bit that takes place on Earth, but mostly it's very a, a cosmic tale, which is which is neat, actually. Uh, some of the animation in this thing is, you know, Toy Animation did a lot of work on it. There was a lot of Korean animation, but there's a lot more detail to the drawings and a lot more depth and color. And there's some really, really cool, like abstract surreal visuals in this thing. Um, you know, it definitely kicks heavy metals, butt in terms of execution of animation, you know, the, the transformers themselves were always, I'd always laugh. Cause you know, even Optimus prime is cool as the angles of his face are and the, the design, you know, his mouthpiece just kind of moving up and down was another cheap way of not animating mouths. Uh, much seen later in series like Mask, where they're like, well, put masks on everybody's face the whole time so they can just be like... <laughs> and totally cheap out on drying mouths. Uh, but this thing is... It, you can see it had a little bit more budget to it, and it shows. It's a fun flick. It's got some okay characters, a lot of goofiness, a lot of over-the-top goofy characters. But they managed to drag in some uh, interesting luminaries looking for a paycheck from Leonard Nimoy to Eric Idle to Robert Stack, uh, Frank Welker, and Judd Nelson, of all people, as Hot Rod, which is pretty fascinating. So it's not a bad tale. It's got a lot of uh, adventures that if you were a kid my age growing up, you probably have ingrained in your heart. Uh, I'm not one of them, but it was cool seeing this for the first time from the distance of a couple decades and, you know, mellowing my, not disdain for it, but my antipathy for the series had kind of mellowed a little bit. Uh, so yeah, it was cool checking it out in HD. This is from a new um, restoration project done and it's delivered in HD in both the original theatrical aspect ratio matted to 1.85 to one and a uh, four to three version as well. So there's two separate discs on here, which is very cool that they went that route. And um, 
there's been tons of internet buzz already about you know the coloring of the film and hot rod in particular can run pink or you know very bright magenta ish whereas the toy was a lot darker and closer to a maroon color and that caused a fan freak out which was hilarious because if you follow some of the forums etc going on uh, it led to a situation where there was a super fan of Transformers who actually owns tons of early production and demo and test models of the toys and showed that, yes, indeed, Hot Rod did have a, a much brighter, like, neon-esque color palette to them. Uh, even the answer that, you know, this gives is that they went back to the original cells to reference the colors uh, wasn't <laughs> answer enough for the fans because they're like, well, th that could be you know, faded over time, etc. And so finally, with pretty much proof in their eyes, it, it uh, ruined the fun of trash talking this newest uh, <laughs> Shout Factory output uh, because people people's love to complain for sure. Um, but someone from my uh, viewpoint, <laughs> I, I, I don't really care about Hot Rod. I just got introduced to him a couple of days ago. Not that I want him to die as a character or anything like that, but if he's pink or magenta or maroon, I could give a damn. So that, in some regards, that makes me not the guy to be uh, reviewing this with an, an integral, you know, microscopic eye. Uh, but obviously, there's plenty of people out there to do that for me. Uh, but yeah, th the colors are gorgeous in this thing. And yeah, there's so many like cosmic, bizarre moments with you know planets being eaten up and some bizarre elements. It's very much not based on Earth as we know it, which is cool. It, it's definitely. Uh, a flight of fancy and takes you to a lot of strange worlds meet a lot of strange characters along the way and it was consistently engaging and evolving uh just from the look of it all from you know gradations in the skies and if the characters weren't just always one solid color they would have you know kind of edging that would be a little bit darker etc and um yeah the look of it was really really uh captivating and very vibrant overall and it had a good uh, contrast to it as well i was very uh, impressed with because i've heard some people complain about washed out variants of this and i never thought it was washed out i thought like the space scenes were largely very punchy and the colors were punchy because of that uh, good contrast and the blacks being deep and and fairly rich so yeah, it's gorgeous looking. Uh, both, you know, the HD version or the 1.33 to 1 version, you can decide which one you want to see if you're used to seeing it more on VHS or home video or if you want to see the more theatrical experience. There was a, a couple bits that were interesting. There's some dirt and stuff on frame to frame, but there was one bit in particular where it was uh, showing you Daniel and Hot Rod, their introduction sitting on the side of a lake, and it looked like I was going blind for a second. There was almost like a double image or some sort of interlacing problem. That shot in particular was only about well, maybe 10 seconds long, and I didn't really notice anything else like that throughout it. Uh, so there was that problem, I guess. Um, and yeah, all the controversial dialogue is in place. So when uh, Spike drops an S-bomb at one scene, which was, man, that was a bomb. I heard that was the S-bomb heard around the world. I heard about that from my friends. For like, It was the most amazing thing that ever happened. Uh, and yeah, Orson Welles, obviously, voices Unicron, the planet devourer, and you know, <laughs> his attitude towards the film may mirror my own a little bit, though he might have been a little bit more old man get off my lawn about it than I was. Uh, but yeah, check this out if you're a fan. Audio's in stereo on 5.1. Uh, the score by uh, Vince DiCola is really cool. This thing is total 80s stadium verging on hair rock. The Transformers theme was redone by the band Lion, which is really cool. Um, there's a lot from a band called Kick Axe, which had to come up with a different name because you can't have a band referencing Kick Ass in the soundtrack to Transformers. Uh, but they do a bunch of cool stuff. Bizarrely, out of all this like kind of heroic anthemic hair cock rock, there's Weird Al Yankovic's Dare to be Stupid in the middle of this thing, uh, which, if you've ever heard the lyrics to Dare to be Stupid, are completely ridiculous and don't mirror any of the action going on. But it takes place in a fun bit where a lot of the, the, the Transformers meet each other and kind of revel and, and have a big dance party, essentially. <laughs> uh, some bizarre stuff there. Uh, and that itself was a, um, a riff on the stylings of Devo, and they couldn't, obviously, I guess, d get Devo, who had... Maybe they saw heavy metal and liked what Devo did with their working at a coal mine cover and like, we'll get that, but get Weird Al in there instead. Um, but yeah, it's got some anthemic tunes from Stan Bush and yeah, 
things that you'll be singing in the shower the day after checking it out. So that stuff uh, comes across pretty well. The the 5.1 mix overall is is sometimes mixed better than others. There's some good impacts. There's some good low end occasionally with some explosions. Uh, sometimes it's mixed a little little strange, or some channels are a little quieter than you think they would be. Uh, but overall, not too bad. Not extremely enveloping, uh, but you know, got got the job done. Special features are cool, and obviously this has been celebrated before on DVD, but uh, one of the cool things they do on this Blu-ray give you an insight as to the, the restoration, which was great. It shows you actually them scanning the film for the 4K transfer. It shows you all the processes that go on thereafter in, in the restoration and putting it together. So it's cool, really cool seeing that uh, angle for the behind the scenes as well. There is also a new making of piece called Till All Are One, which is, you know, pretty comprehensive documentary getting into all sorts of aspects of the production, the creation, the conception of it, why they decided to make Transformers the movie, what it all meant, and then going into the marketing and the music. Now, I love that they, they concentrated so much on the music of the film. They got Stan Bush on there talking about it and Vince DiCola and, and otherwise. But cast-wise, obviously, you can't have the people that have passed on. But they do have, you know, some of the regulars, and um, they got Dan Gilvezon, who I know as the voice of Spider-Man from Spider-Man and his amazing friends. So it was really cool hearing him. Uh, but Greg Berger's also in there, Neil Ross, uh, Susan Blue, and uh, Flint Dilly is largely the creative member that is uh, spoken to the most about the creation of the film. Uh, he was, you know, story consultant and and so much more, and he talks about how this was. And this again ties into my feelings about Transformers. This was largely a very clinical way of introducing a new toy line and killing off key members of the old toy line. Um, so again, that taps into my feeling that these aren't living, breathing characters. These aren't my childhood friends that saw me through the tough times and the bad times. These were plastic toys that were cynically in a way marketed to people like me, and we were exploited and taught to love these toys. <laughs> so... Uh, in a way, that never worked on me. So I was never, uh, you know, super, super saddened by the death of certain characters. But it is kind of icky that they did that. And they were like, yes, let's kill this main character. As a, as a you know, people can accuse Disney as, as being very brutal in causing children to cry. But uh, I don't know, there's a whole other level of hell almost for the uh, the suits behind the, the concept of killing characters that they forced into being beloved icons to children in order to then sadden those children and then force them to go buy new beloved icons. Uh, so that you know, gets me a little twitchy. Uh, and it is interesting seeing some of the, the, the kind of creative consultants, etc., behind this product, how they kind of treat it like product. You know, they definitely appreciate the fandom that sprouted up over it. But you could tell at heart that back in the day, in the mid 80s, this was a job. Yeah. This was, we got a whole stack of toys that we need to make into characters, get to work, everybody. And, you know, that maybe this wasn't exactly all done with intense love and a burning desire to tell the story of the survivors of Cybertron, etc. It was like, what are we going to do? Let's make this guy into this, and this guy does this, and whatever. So, uh, there was a little bit of that, and they don't always hide that extremely well. But you can tell they're extremely... Uh, thankful for the fandom that has sprouted up and you know going to cons and seeing people lining up around the block to get their autographs you could tell they are legitimately moved by that which is cool uh, so yeah there's a lot of tales about making the film how it came about nelson shin the director is he's actually really excited about the product and goes out of his way to point out some of the cooler aspects of it uh the coloring of the film like how he tries to have it like more of an orangish palette for the the autobots and uh, more like purplish tone for the Decepticons. That's cool, and everybody is definitely proud of the, the kind of more abstract, surreal visuals going on in this film that you could almost excise from it and loop and have playing in the background at a metal concert. <laughs> really uh, would go go over well. It was cool how they all appreciate the big stadium rock feel of the, the soundtrack for this thing. Uh, there's also a bunch of cooler, older ported extras from the older like 20th anniversary editions, which is Neat because it has a lot of the same people, but asked different questions, like what their favorite moments were, favorite character moments, etc. And uh, yeah, so that's good to have as a historical piece in case you didn't already buy the earlier incarnations of the film. And there's also some animated storyboards, trailers, TV spots, etc. 
to have the 1.33 to 1 version in HD is awesome. To have the theatrical aspect ratio in HD is pretty awesome. You know, to have it uh, color corrected a little bit and, and looking far sharper and far more uh, luscious than it ever has is awesome. If you're a fan, even if you bought it this couple times, yeah, you're going to probably want to do yourself a favor and pick up the Blu-ray version. Uh, and even for a sidelong kind of you know, ancillary fan such as myself, yeah, this is cool. I'm definitely going to watch this again. And it's fun to watch with friends that are super fans of the series, so um, they don't mind necessarily that I'm not you know, getting any uh, tattoos of Hot Rod on my arm or anything like that. Uh, but I can hang with it and, and have a good time. And watching them totally geek out over it makes me have a better time as well. So it's fun for the whole family and for you know the family that has now grown up and turned into a bunch of people my age who are looking back fondly on the mid-80s. So yeah, Transformers the movie. Killer release for sure. So thanks for hanging out as always and hopefully you had a good time and hopefully you did not uh, despise me now that I have revealed that I am not a dyed-in-the-wool Transformers mega fan even though I can appreciate what it is and what it means to other people. So uh, yeah, that's out there. But anyways, it was very cool hanging out in the world of Cybertron and the Autobots and Decepticons. And uh, I'll talk to you soon with some more reviews, more Laserdisc content coming your way shortly as well. Thanks. Cheers, everybody.